Sounds pretty good, man. Gotta admit. Sounds good over the phone speaker, man. Yeah. Yeah, we can the phone, so. Yeah, same, same. All right. I see two people watching, but do you think that's us? People, when you're watching, just comment. That's right. <laughs> uh, Let's see. Well, I set it to be at 11. I wonder if I can see instance of chat live. Yeah, we'll see if we'll see who logs in. But uh, since you're both here, there are some people who come in. Oh, hello, Bootzilla82. Cool. So let's um, let's start with actually talking about something we didn't touch on in like the how to hold to thing, which is like some tone stuff. Because I'm I'm assuming you guys uh, have your own ways of doing it. So I have a tone. I was reading a little bit, like let's like starting with like lead tone. Um, you know, I know that like he sets his amps real dark. Like, do you guys do that? How do you <sighs> sound? Like the EQ. Let's see, so this one I have here, uh, the gain is on like seven, mm -hmm. right? The bass is on seven. Mid is like halfway, trebles like seven. Uh, that's the EQ. That's right. all the EQ. Because I was I was reading a bunch of stuff where it's like you know on the on the Yamaha amps like the presence and treble are like on one or two, like super dark. Right. Okay. So like the whole thing is is you have to EQ things based on like what you're working with because. The closest I ever got to his tone was with like this, the Ibanez that I played that C minor thing on. Yeah. Uh, it was like a $75 pawn shop guitar. Uh, so, it was that 410 Fender DeVille. And it was a two man plus from the 90s and a 21 or a GSP 21 Pro from the 90s. Right. And then so I like matched his tone on none too soon right so i pulled intro to countdown and i just looped it and i just eq'd until i got it to sound like that right then when i got my holdsworth guitar it was too bright right so i had to re-eq things based on that guitar mm -hmm. you know because it was EQ'd for my ibanez which has different pickups different wood it's not chambered right so there's like all these things you got to think about uh but the other thing that you always see, man, is like everybody like, oh, you need a magic stop. You need this equipment. You need that. All this money. The stuff that I matched his tone with the best on was the cheapest stuff there is, you know. So it's not really about expensive equipment or anything like that. It's just about your ear and being able and the equipment that you have and being able to get the equipment you have to sound as close to that. If that's what you want to do as you can, you know. Yeah. I don't know. But like the sort of ambient stuff like that. I, I know like he had like his own, like stereo imaging with uh those basically it's like stereo slapbacks, right? That are yeah. Out of yeah, time. The delay stuff you, like that. Um go I couldn't hear you. Do what? Do you hold on. Do you, do you use that shit for your lead tones? Uh yeah, there is a little bit of that. Yeah, there's like two delays. Uh, that are like panned, like this is on my um, on my uh, what is that amplitude five, right? The way I kind of have stuff set. Um, I've got some different pedals, you know, like a tube screamer. Um, I've got like a pitch shifter thing, which I'm actually not. Well, I'm not using that on this, but that's for like the. Uh, that's for like, you know, uh, metal fatigue and stuff where he uses like the pitch shifting. Yeah. You know, um, like that kind of stuff. But and, and Thomas, like when you when you're playing live, uh, like what do you use to get like in pedal form to get like the dirt? I'm assuming I, I remember you you're playing through like a combo, like a fender kind of thing. What, what is it? Yeah. Through a twin. Um, twin. Is that? Yeah. It's an amp called a Vibrosonic, which is basically a twin, but instead of two twelves, it has one fifteen. Okay. Uh, same circuit. 
it's basically a twin. But dude, I've always it's literally changed all the time the the overdrive pedal I use. It used to be just a tube screamer, and then for a while it was like a BB preamp. Um, and then for a while it was the uh, Holdsworth overdrive pedal, and now I'm the uh, SD9, the Maxon. SD9. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that thing's sick. That's the best. That's my favorite overdrive pedal I've found to date. Because it's like, I could just I just want something that I don't have to stack uh, multiple overdrives, just one pedal to do it. And that one retains the bass and it gives you enough drive and it sounds the best to my ear. Don't you love how they designed that tone knob that when it goes a little bit past zero, it just cleans everybody's teeth? Yeah, you got to have, that's the only catch, man. You can't use the tone knob on it. I don't know. I don't understand. I mean, I guess the Scott Henderson um, new pedal is basically that pedal with a functioning tone knob. Yeah, so, that's what I've what I've heard, man. Have you tried that one out yet? Not, I have not. Uh, Bootzilla says that the SL drive is quite good for his drive tones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing with drive is like you know, like what you really want is like sustain without buzziness. And, yep. Uh, you get there so so thomas what do you do for delays so de do delay i always have gone after the kind of andy timmons type delay actually so uh he uses like two different delay times i think he uses like a quarter note and a dotted eighth delay i think um what's up it's it's like a chim 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 that kind of thing that kind of thing right and um I know Holdsworth does different stuff, but to me, that delay sound is pretty killer. And it gets you in the vibe uh, of that kind of Eric Johnson-y clean sound and stuff like that. I love it. But I've also been experimenting with uh, doing two different delay times. One super short delay time that almost just doubles and thickens the note. And then a longer delay time. And that sounds super Holdsworthian, I've noticed. I think he did that at one point. What? A second range you're playing with to get the doubling to get the uh... even tell you i don't look at a specific number it's just until it like literally just sounds like it's thickening up the note it's so short you know not hearing like a second attack right it's not a doo -doo. it's like a no. yeah like it's not fact exactly <coughs> and uh, like the best right like so somebody's asking like what's the best delay i don't think there's a timeline just... timeline no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> for like alan's tone i don't think there's any you know like i said anything that's particularly the best and like i you know i don't have the money to just buy a bunch of equipment so um i just work with what i have you know and at the time when i matched his tone the closest like I said, it was uh, all the equipment that I had from the 90s, you know, yeah. and a pawn shop. <laughs> like, if that doesn't tell you you don't need good equipment, I don't know. Yeah, but it's like that Branford Marsalis quote, right? Like, tone comes from how you hear it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, yeah. I really do believe that. Like, how you hear tone in your head is kind of what ultimately ends yeah, up. Yeah, you have to out. have an expectation of the sound that's coming out, that's going to come out, Yeah, too, you know. 100%. But, in nobody wants to hear that though <laughs> yeah nobody wants to hear that they want to know what's the secret pedal well, dude, i will say the yeah. uh, the alan holdsworth uh j rocket overdrive pedal that they don't make anymore that's one of the best overdrive pedals i've ever heard ever man yeah, like good. it destroys it's like a super transparent overdrive it destroys like the clon it destroys all that stuff it's amazing i don't know how it's not more popular i mean everything alan put out you know just got discontinued right but that overdrive pedal is incredible man it's like clear but sustaining uh, yeah. the only thing i don't like sound i like i have to push both buttons at the same time he's like the uh overdrive and the boost yeah the boost so I, I, mm -hmm. that's the sound i like man because when you hit the boost it gives you a little bit more overdrive and it just it's just enough for the notes to pop out and sustain but it's clear it's amazing it's why, why one of the best why did you switch to the sd9 just because I'm always switching stuff up, man. You know, I get used to something and I just, it's just, I don't know. That's just more of a mental problem than anything else. I still go back to it. You know what I mean? The SD9 is kind of a different vibe, you know? Um, but I just, I'm just always switching stuff up. You should try the Vertex Ultraphonics. 
that's my I I can't the best nine and that one are always kind of like they're both on my pedal board and I always uh find myself like for a few months really liking one for a few months really liking the other but they're just two colors in a very similar ballpark um when I was doing like and gigs and stuff with my dad I was doing the the overdrive the uh J Rocket Holdsworth overdrive on all the time and then the Maxon hit that on in solos and it would sound insane, man. Super nice. Yeah. We'll see. Like, cause I was just talking about equipment and stuff, not being a thing and guitars, but like my, when I got my fat boy, like, man, the tone on that thing, like even compared to my, to my headless, uh, Holdsworth, like just the sustain, like the, I don't know what it is about that guitar, man, but like there's just a richness and a sustain. Yeah. That, like I can't get the other guitar. I haven't been able to get it from any other guitar. So. <laughs> like, yeah. Super, or like Rick. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really resonant, you know? Um, like, a, it's like an, a, a, a spin on a telly that made it like, makes it awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have gotten very close with the DV Mark multi amp FG as well as the GH two fifty. Yeah, those I, I really haven't fucked around with those uh like Fringham Bali kind of uh digital amps. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's yeah, that shit it can be such a distraction. You can put so much time, like your patches, you know, and uh you know, at the end it's something that gives you good workflow but yeah i mean the, the, i find that there are a lot of people who don't know how to get in the ballpark of uh of the tone which which is surprising like i always suspect that like people just don't put enough time in trial and error you know because yeah. at the end of the day there are only like so many if you have like some sort of delay some sort of overdrive and a tube amp you should be able to figure it out by yeah. twisting. Yeah, you, yeah, you'll be fine. <laughs> you'll yeah, be fine. man. I mean, because most of that sound is just in his legato technique, anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah his, he's like so, he's got such a light touch. Yeah, man. I watched. To... I watched the thing uh, you did with Alex uh, Sill, man. I mean, he's getting that sound out of a tube screamer and yeah. a clean amp and a rat. Yeah. Yeah, so record. it's like it's really just that the legato touch, you know. Yeah, uh, but that that shit that, that let's not talk about that. Yeah, that's not, you know we don't. <laughs> we're so fucking. He is the fat. My <laughs> fat boy, the uh, Holdsworth Overdrive, yeah, and a magic stomp. You're set. Yep. Yeah. I have to say that UD stomp is special. Magic stomp, Dude. good, but that's the the special man. Huh? Or patch. Magic stomp, it's super sick, man. Yeah, the, like, uh, the, the chorus sounds, dude, just like literally took me back to listening to some of those albums. I was like, holy shit, that's the sound right there, you know? Well, yeah. they were, yeah, the we have were programmed by Chip Flynn, which was Alan's friend in guitar tech, I think, from, from the 70s or whatever. So they actually have the sounds Alan used, you know. They were his pedals. I mean, they were actually his pedals. Yeah. So. Well, that's great. Cool. Well, I, I just want to remind people, feel free to ask music questions. But I do feel like people, like if people watched episode one, are still so confused from that. And we just yeah. kind of ran through the whole gamut of uh, <laughs> of all the possibilities and uh, things to talk about but yeah let's see if anybody has a musical question go for it guys it's your time i think they just asked they're scared <laughs> fucking crazy crazy holdsworth texans <laughs> uh, but yeah maybe, maybe i'll start um so thomas what do you think about I, I had this thing that I still think is a very logical way of looking at the nine note scales. I don't know what to do with it, but it's um, 
it just seems intuitive to me. Like what what I was writing Thomas about, and I think I told you about it like after the first time we talked, about looking at the nine note scales as being stacked in scale fourths. So like if you take like the C major add flat three, flat six, <coughs> sorry about the cough, and uh, you just go and stack scale fourths, what you end up getting is a D minor triad, an E augment, an E flat augmented triad, and an E augmented triad, I believe. Is that true? Yes, it's true. So, and then they just invert. Yeah. Right? You're looking at like a nine note scale and you're just looking at like three, 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 right? And it's, but it, I couldn't find anything else that will invert symmetrically. But then I saw that like any of those four scales could be, the four nine note scales could be looked at in that way. I guess my question is like, is that a logical way to organize this material? I mean, it kind of reminds me of like looking at the uh, Barry Harris scale as like a C6 and then a diminished chord inverted. Right. right. It's kind of like this. I, to me, though, uh, I mean, the easiest way is just thinking about it as the major scale with the added notes. Like that seemed to me, and I know everybody's different in how they view mm -hmm. things, but to me, like that's the easiest way to to organize it in my brain, you know, or thinking about it from like what kind of subset scales are inside of it. Like if I know that C major, C harmonic major, C melodic minor, uh, A harmonic minor and A uh, Hungarian minor are in that scale, then I can, I can, uh, you know, figure out everything I need to figure out thinking about it that way. In your mind, like the subset thinking, is that some like do you find yourself in one context like let's say you're playing on a d minor chord and you're using c add flat three flat six do you find yourself sliding into c melodic minor a hungarian minor yep right so that, that yeah kind of, you actually do it with seven notes with like they're a part of the family yeah, yeah, totally. Like I, I've, I've found myself doing it a lot with like mode three thinking because like Hungarian minor is a subset of mode three. <sighs> doing a Hungarian minor thing to highlight a certain sound and then going into a more augmented sound in a mode three context and really organizing it, thinking of it as two different things in the same scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, recently I've actually started seeing two different scales. I can see two scales at the same time on the neck. Like I was seeing, uh, I was just playing, improvising on something, and I was seeing the high strings as like uh, one scale, and I was seeing the lower strings as another scale, and I was able to take these symmetrical shapes and kind of, I did it in the in that uh, on that track that we did, yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. So one of the I played on that, I can't remember actually, but uh, what did I do? Right, so I'm seeing like uh, kind of mode three and jazz major flat three flat six at the same time. I you know, see. hard to explain, man. It's just like the more you mess with this stuff, and uh, I get it. Breath has multiples. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just I don't know, man. I think it's just like people have to really just experiment with it. Spend a lot of time with it. Like I've spent a lot of time with those two scales in particular. So, yeah, you know, but when you, uh, when you both like, uh, overlaid uh, on other, or do you see them on different strings or different areas of the neck? Yeah. I'm like, a for whatever reason, I just saw them. I saw like the, uh, lower strings as the B flat jazz major. And I saw the high strings as I just saw it. And it was in the moment when I was playing the thing. So I can't explain it, but I, but when I saw it, I was like, oh, that's freaking weird. You know, it was like a weird thing that I had never seen it that way before, you know? Yeah, and I think for, for me, like, you know how sometimes you just do certain licks in certain registers of the guitar, right? Yeah, maybe there's that. It's too, for me, it's things. a lot. Did he freeze or 
Did you... No, no. Oh, I think he froze. Uh, did you freeze? Not frozen. Oh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you're in shock. <laughs> She's like, still. I can see myself. Uh, One second. Oh, no. Yeah, you're... I'm frozen? Oh. It looks like you're, yeah, you're good. good. Okay, good. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Going. Now you're good, man. I think they're frozen. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're not frozen. Okay. No, but but keep going. So you you were saying that like how everybody you play certain licks in certain registers on the guitar, certain string sets, just because of the way it feels or the way it sounds, right? Um. And then you see those, and then when you get to another set of, or different string set, maybe lower on the guitar, then a different thing pops in your head that you typically would always play on those string sets. It's like kind of where you play certain licks, and then you end up connecting these things in these ways where you you can actually look at it as two different subset scales inside the same scale. Yeah, I was seeing, uh, but these weren't subsets inside. Yeah, you, of, two yeah different scales, it was right? like, uh, but it was kind of like the shapes. Right, like the minor third half step in the half step whole step shape. I was seeing kind of that. Um, and I just played it like, oh, there it is. Play it in the moment. All this stuff's just flying through your head. But uh, and what did you say? I'm saying if you do this enough, we're going to start to have visions. I love it. Uh <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start taking some questions. So, Jay. Uh, Kesa says, uh, could Brett explain slowly how he visualizes the major flat three, flat six on the fretboard? Yeah, we just talked about that, right? So the... You need to learn the nine modes of the scale. He's talking about the across shapes. Well, Alan didn't think about modes. Um, I don't really think about the modes, you know, but... As far as like visually playing them, yeah, I mean you play them, you know. Yeah. But I'm not not thinking of them as different modes. I'm just thinking of them as part of that scale, you know. Yeah. So okay. I'm just from the highest note to the from the highest note or lowest note to the highest note or whatever. That's how I'm trying to see it. It's like, uh, which is what Alan talks about, and it just makes a lot of sense that way. Um. The other thing we were just talking about was uh, before we came on here was the uh, voicings and stuff like that and how difficult naming some of those voicings are and like uh, how the symbols, Alan's symbols just make more and more sense. The fact that he did it that way, because, you know, as I'm editing the book, like I'm changing some some of the chord symbol names that I had originally or whatever. And like, uh, and they could be viewed either way. You're not, there's, it's not, neither way was wrong. I'm just trying to make a more clear way to see it. But like, they're just really, for some of the voicings, there is not a clear, there's not a chord symbol that represents the chord he's playing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, you can tell it's just a group of notes He's just thinking about that symbol, and that's that's really all there is to it. Yeah. You know? Like, you have uh, maybe the bass note you're relating it to, and then the scale it comes from, and it's just drawing information from there. Right. Okay. Yeah. Here's he's really okay. talking about, uh, about visualizing that scale. Like Thomas said, right? For me, it's really just, mm. well, it's seeing those shapes that we talked about on all the episodes. And then it's seeing, knowing my major scales in all the positions, and then just knowing where those A flats and E flats are. Right. I just see. I've that mentality gets tricky for people like if they're if the basis of their knowledge is major scales and like these kind of like across modal fingerings uh the points where maybe they're drawing it from a flat to a flat or e flat to e flat on the fretboard are probably more foreign because you know that doesn't neatly fit inside that kind of vision of the neck right 
Well, I mean, um, part of the thing could be the, you know, I mean, there's different ways to go about it, man. I mean, you can play all in one position, but you can just play your major scales, you know, the way Alan plays them. Instead of so whichever one you do, like, like for me, I just had to kind of like start seeing them this way, which I did for a long time. But like uh, whenever I started just trying to think of this as my position, right? So it's all just right here. And then when I'm here, it's all right here. And there is no switching until I actually switch into the next scale or the next position, you know what I mean? And then so there, it's all very, uh, that vertical. Horizontal. Yeah, that's one. So like, yeah, one so, it's what, so yeah, that's how I'm seeing it, man. And I just see those, those, uh, extra notes. I see where they're at yeah. in like all the positions, you know? Yeah, that makes so, sense. Okay. Uh, how about this? Somebody wrote about hammer-ons from nowhere. He wrote quotation marks, but I'm not sure if it's a quote. Uh, and this wrong statement that Alan didn't use pull-offs because uh, because of this slight out of tune thing. Where is the truth? Uh, well, he did do pull-offs. <laughs> Where is the truth? Yeah, he did do pull-offs. He doesn't do a lot of pull-offs, right? He's not doing like I think, you know the the misconception or the, the confusion comes between like when most most people play legato like myself included it's like a lot of rolls like that kind of thing right but alan would be more like uh you know he'd be more like like you see that when he plays that line actually and it's all hammer right so and then he'll slide and then he'll actually do pull-offs right there. And then hammer, pull-off. You know? Yeah. So, but it's like it's a choice to play, like, certain lines. That's why his lines, man, when, you've, when you figure out his lines, they're very specific ways that they're played. And once you figure out, like, what that is, you know, like, uh, like one of his most common arpeggios... Like, no matter what arpeggio he does, like, it's almost always like a pick, hammer, pick, hammer type thing, you know? Yeah. So, there's, Do what? A, there's a technical template to what he's doing, and once you understand the motion, it's easier to understand the approach to the guitar. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, you heard it here, folks. The pull <laughs> method works. There you go. That's the best right now. I mean, I know it's kind of confusing, but uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, I've been playing. Yeah. I've been playing these over drones, getting the sounds to resonate like a palette of certain whiskeys uh, for certain whiskeys. Also, certain polychords arpeggios from these scales. Uh, more of a statement than a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Uh, how was? How has your playing views on music changed since going down the Holdsworth rabbit hole? Has it been a challenge incorporating these ideas in your playing? Uh, I mean, it's completely changed my views on music, you know, and the way the way I think about theory and all of that stuff is completely turned upside down, you know. So, yeah. like, uh, coming from a traditional place and then logging all those scales and playing through all those scales and like you know and then becoming more and more just attuned to the way alan thinks and you're you know like my uh my thinking has started to shift you know i mean it took time it took time it wasn't like overnight but like over time like my uh way i think about music just completely shifts and like we were just talking about, we, we see now why Alan didn't like to talk about music. Because when you start to like 
shift your mind to think this way, it is really hard to explain to people. It's like something, it's almost like something you just have to experience, right? So, uh, I don't know, Thomas, what do you think? It's hard to say, man, because um, I was with Brett. I've been with Brett, hanging out with Brett for so many years. And just looking up to him, wanting to be like Brett, play like Brett and all that. I just kind of like, this stuff seemed normal to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not normal. But, 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 <laughs> but I think it, it kind of is, though, because honestly, like, it's, um, it, it still feels uh, no different than the way a lot of typical, like, jazz players think about applying melodic minor scales or diminished yeah. scales. Like, it yeah. really is the same way. The, the, the difference is that there's a lot more applications you can apply these scales in a lot of different ways. And I think it can get overwhelming and you start thinking, well, what's right, what's wrong. And you really just have to, you just have to jump into it and try it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, you know, uh, so like, yeah, when you add the E flat to that, uh, to the C major scale, right. And you end up with this chord, like an E flat major, right. Uh, and then you play that scale over that. I mean, you're playing the majority of notes you're playing are coming from C major. And like, that's not a typical scale choice right, for, for a chord. But then it sounds, you know, it makes it sounds out or whatever, even though it's technically not really. But yeah, but the sound themselves sounds strange because it's just. It's something that people aren't used to hearing, you know? Yeah, because you're, you're justifying all the notes that you <laughs> typically think are bad notes to play over chords. Right. Yeah. And yeah. They all, they're all related yep. in this way, yeah, though. Yeah, exactly. In, in this way of thinking. That's one, that's one of the things that's so cool about this way of thinking, you know, and this approach is it just, man, it opens up so much and, like, um to actually to actually be able to make those choices and have like a logical reason why you're making it, you know what I mean? And having it still relate to that chord, even though like thinking C major over E flat major is like not typically, you're not going to find that in a theory book. <laughs> I, I, if I want to get better at this, I need to play with new people. I need, I need new friends like it because like, Whenever I throw anything in, everybody looks at me, and uh, like you know, it's like Danny. Like he has this look that gives me every time I try to put it in. Like he's just like listening to my soul. Then he goes like, you know, gives me like a sigh. <laughs> and it's very, very hard to concentrate with what you're doing. And I find that now I'm like looking up to see if he's looking, if anybody's looking at me. It's it's really corporate. Like you know, our music just has. It's so much like. So many homoerotic moments in it with triads in one key that it just this stuff pops up like real hard again. But yeah. uh and know. but I mean, you know, that's what I like to hear that though, you know. I mean that's what there was a quote by Alan too, where he said he likes to do uh play things that make people want to pick up the needle and back, you know, it was an old interview, obviously he's talking about vinyl, right? So you hear something and you go, holy shit, what was that? And you rewind it to hear it again, <clears throat> you know, because it was, it's not just your typical choice, you know, or sound that you're used to hearing. Well, you know? okay. Uh, let's take more questions. Can you ask them what type of patterns, approaches, ideas would Alan take if he was playing the pentatonic blues scale? Yeah. So, like, uh, <clears throat> uh, most of the time when he plays pentatonic, there's an added note, right? So, like, uh, it's either going to be, like, the flat five, obviously, so it's blue scale, or he'll add the flat seven. There's a lick in, uh, I don't remember it, though. Well, there's that one, right, which is from the drums of yellow. Yeah, but then there's, yeah. I don't remember it. But there's a line in... Uh, what was it? I don't remember it, but there's a line in the drums are yellow that's like F minor pentatonic. But it, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He does, uh, do after that. Uh, 
and Thomas was just working on that solo, so he should have that shit together. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he plays a typical blues lick sometimes. Yeah, he does sometimes. Yeah. And then sometimes it's like... He's played that. You know? A lot of times it's like straight up, the big blue, like the pentatonic. But then he'll add like a note. So it's like... Uh, but you can tell he's kind of thinking pentatonic and Dorian ish type things you know yeah so nice. normal way a real but nod then, to the working man do what like a nod to the working man yeah <laughs> dude it is <laughs> it, there's usually an added note in like you know most of the time when he's playing it somewhere in the line there's going to be like an added major seven there's going to be like a you know a ninth added or the six or yeah. Flat five, you know. But I think the question was about fingering and patterns. So, like with pentatonic, be like the uh, first string. Oh. Yeah, I mean, there's. So yeah, he will do some yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, like three note per string pentatonic. Had a three note per string type thing. With the string. Uh, so... Do what? With the string skipping a lot. Yeah, with the string skipping. But there's not really as much of that as like you might think. Like really, when he's playing pentatonic, like most of the time, it's like that kind of. Yeah. Or he does. That line Thomas was playing where it was like, uh, you know, it's got like a more intervallic kind of vibe to it, you know. But it's still just the pentatonic with the added note. All know? right. Well, Chris uh, says I started working on connecting major key centers through diminished interchange for example g half whole also b flat d flat e half whole connecting c major e flat g g flat major and a major once again chris more of a statement than a question but i'm happy that uh you're working hard it's <laughs> exciting uh, brett for crimes against humanity the holdsworth head very abomination then he should be one sentence to an eternity of working in salt mines or Two tarred and feathered before eternally uh, in salt mines. All of his uh, punishments include salt. <laughs> <laughs> think that? Uh, did you think that the deep fake was an abomination? Brett, serious <laughs> question. Uh, Hilarious. <laughs> abomination. Hey, yeah. People need to like. Yeah, lighten up. Yeah, yeah man. Right. But I'm getting a lot of face swapping. Yeah. Here. How can you face swap with my hero? And then I've, I tried to explain that it's not, I didn't actually take his face. Um, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, like the off, man. Yeah, the, the, the internet folk that get, off. being offended must be so tiring, you know? Yeah. Like, just by your phone. <laughs> Trying to offend people too. That's pretty tiring. Like on <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, Hungarian Mayan seems to be an important piece of the puzzle. It's altered flat six sound over major in the major flat three flat six scale, and four of those scales move symmetrically in messian mode three. That scale has. Allen's three notes per string, half step minor third, and third half step. That subset scale seems to be crucial. Is that scale a major source of lines and phrasing in these larger scales? So the question is, what role does the Hungarian minor play in this vocabulary? All right. Well, uh, as far as Allen's lines, I actually only found just specifically a Hungarian minor wants. Really? Where there were, no, yeah, there were no notes outside of that scale, but um, there's still a chance he was just thinking mode three and just happened to play that. So I just personally like Hungarian yeah, minor. Exactly. So, it just sounds dope. Yeah, so that's what like, it is, man. Yeah, yeah. And when, as a subset, um, I just started using it a lot. You yeah, know, it like was a, it was another way of visualization. Yeah. yeah. So what would be like a, you know, you had to like, 
use your way of just navigating through Hungarian minor? What's like a typical way you'd see it on the neck or play a line with it? You know, the string. string and like, so, uh, like in that, um, in mode three, right, like I'll see that, like there was a line I played in something where I was just doing that. I was going through, I was trying to do like the kind of scales that don't complete themselves in one octave type thing. And, uh, but I was staying in mode three um, and I was playing like the three Hungarian minors that are in that key, a major third apart. You yeah. Know? Um, but like, as far as Alan, like I only found it like that one time and the drums were yellow um, and there were no notes outside of, of it but i still thought he was kind of thinking mode three there based on just the shapes and stuff he was using but since there weren't since there were no lines outside of that i called it hungarian minor in the book but um and oh. then when i found subset like i said i just started messing with it more i don't All know right. time got minor stuff i mean it goes back to the thing we were talking about where like if you think about a certain scale certain vocabulary just pops into your head right i always do like which i technically play it's technically actually e flat uh uh major add flat three flat six but i'm thinking about it in mode three because it's just one note different i always do this and when i get here i go I'm visualizing that through patterns that I know in those par in those scales. Yeah, and that's so that's the minor. And then it goes into a more traditional mode three kind of thing. Okay, cool. Well, let's see how can how can one begin to develop better phrasing, given the meandering nature of the legato technique. As I see the notes light up, I can't help but grab notes in X's. In X's? In act. How do you say this? I'm, I'm from Israel. Oh, shit. Uh, I, oh. No. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, to no. my... Except. Uh, yeah. Except. In Bro except. Like, so taking this approach where it's more scale based like this and you're not relying on like the cliches and stuff as much, um, it is hard, you know, I mean, to not Miranda, you know, around. But like even Alan does that on live videos. If you watch live videos, he's not nearly as melodic on live videos as he is on albums, you know, like not even close. So like uh, I think it's just the nature of kind of approaching things this way but there's also that and you just get better at it over time you know what i mean i mean you practice hearing melodies i mean there's times when um when i'm working on i'll put on a chord progression and i just pro i prohibit myself from playing like anything but melodies you know so uh no fast lines, no lines that I know already, no shapes or anything like that. I just try to hear a melody through a set of chords, you know? Um, yeah. You have to, I mean, so, if you melodic, you have to practice trying to play melodic and trying to hear melodies and, you know? Yeah. Also, this probably is not the best uh, forum for asking how to play less. <laughs> <laughs> more <laughs> all right um, uh what fingering would alan be using for the fast augmenti sound run at 215 uh what point one five i don't i don't understand the question at 2.15 are there three notes um uh, the string sound almost like Eddie Van Halen tapping, but obviously won't be. Reminds me of a Randy Rhodes flying high. Remind me of Randy Rhodes is flying high. Um, Is he like time stamping a song? So, I don't know which. So, like, Devil Take That's behind what I was thinking. He's probably thinking that, that three note for string augmented. Yeah, because that. Uh, like that kind of thing. Can't remember exactly what, where he even oh, plays it, but. Peril, premonition, peril, premonition. You're gonna uh, 
Christian. Uh, the only line I can remember from that is this one. Uh, oh, dude, yeah, I think I know what he's talking about. Doesn't that? he do? I don't remember, but I think he does like straight up augmented triad on one string. Oh, the shot. Right? Oh which is, yeah, which is a hell, and he moves it in major thirds, which is like a crazy stretch, man. Yeah, he does that, and the drums are yellow. Then there's a line in uh, one of my favorite lines that I probably can't remember. An 824 fret. Was it? No, I can't remember. Yeah, I need 24 frets for that one. But yeah, he does a lot of augmented triad stuff, which you know, which is like a bitch of a stretch. Yeah, but. there's a there's a line. I think I know what he's talking about. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I know for a fact there's a part where he plays augmented triad on one string, moves. It. I think it's like on the G string, and he goes down to the D and the A. And it's a hell of a stretch, but that's what he's doing. Is it that kind of thing? No, he just literally moves it down the strings, like down major thirds. I, can't, I stay away from that stuff because it's such a big stretch, man. I can't even play yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, it's... Uh, for I mean, for me, I just, like, I hold my guitar in a place that allow for... Like, like this. Who's it? Now we're just noodling around. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> do it. Um, uh, it has. Yeah, he's saying that's one of those pick up the needle moments. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Chris. Questions as well. La, 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 la. Thomas is Brett's brain. I don't understand. What? Are you Brett? <laughs> I have seen a few blues notes. Uh, yeah, okay, well, well. Oh, held up for review. Somebody's talking shit. Let's see, show. Scary. Okay. Um, let's see. How can I commission Thomas Dawson to produce a performance video for my channel? Uh, oh. That's simple. Is that Monk? <laughs> Larry Monk. I think you just did it. So uh, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, Thomas, give out your phone number. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, we can. You can just uh, if you want to email us through our channel, uh, we can put you in touch. That's no problem. Um, let's see. Uh, can they talk about what his most common patterns were? I can sum up Paul Gilbert or Richie Kotzen's guitar playing with one or two patterns that they use in every solo. I suspect that it can't be reduced to a few patterns. No, but, but it can it movements more than patterns. Yeah, right? movements. Right, that stuff. That thing. One thing that he plays in every solo is that like arpeggio I was talking about. He plays like, that in every every solo. Yeah. Right? Yeah. On major any sort of like uh major key type stuff because it's coming out of the major scale. So but like that and then like uh you know that kind of thing. Is that a, Is. I can't remember it. But anyway, those are like typical things. I don't remember it. Can't remember all this. Like I said I don't want to remember it really. I, I, like, uh, like I wanted to learn the stuff. I wanted to figure out where the where the where it was coming from. What scales was he using? Where's this harmony coming from? And then I want to let it go, man. Like, you know, but you won't let me. No, <laughs> so, dude. Guy. You're a <laughs> guy. What, what? It's like, you know, you figured it out. Now, uh, now, now you got to live with it. Yeah. You can't just go back my... and improvise. <laughs> <laughs> can't go back and play my own shit. Nope. 
Uh, what does goat lick, goat lick mean, by the way? Uh, I think it's referring to the greatest of all time. <laughs> it's more of an English question than a uh, than, uh, Holdsworth question, but there you have it. Uh, how did you guys get the legato side of things feeling natural? I guess for a player who's a few years, there is a fair bit of uh, retaining involved, right? I mean, I think this was way. This is way more natural for, for you guys that put in the work. Like, like for me, I can you can I can totally see how um, for a player who um, who doesn't approach the instrument this way, this could be like a battle on a lot of fronts, right? Like, yeah. if, like have a, a heavy right hand or something like that. It's really really hard to. First I mean, for me, it's like I've been playing legato way before I ever uh, got violin, really. I was already playing. That just was natural for me. So, and I was around, you know, my brother and Derek Taylor. Like, my brother is a big picker, right? He's always, picking is really natural for him, and he could just blaze picking all day. Like, he'll never practice his picking, and then he'll shred your face off, you know? But, like... Uh, and Derek Taylor was like the opposite where um, he couldn't pick very well, but he could fucking legato your face off, you know? And so like me being around those two, um, I kind of gravitated more to Derek Taylor because I, mean, I got a little bit of both, but like, uh, I mean, I had, there was a period where I, where I did a lot of picking and stuff, but that was something I had to, to do all the time to maintain it. Whereas legato, like I cannot do legato for weeks on end and then pick it up and do it. You know, it's yeah. just like, it's all, that's just me. I don't know about Thomas. Uh, so for me, it was kind of, I gravitated towards it because I just actually started naturally doing it. I couldn't really pick every single note and I would naturally start to add in hammer-ons and pull-offs and, th and to get things at faster speeds and it just felt natural. Um, and then when I got into the Holdsworth thing, that's when I really started trying to just really not pick as much. You know, if I'm playing three note per string, pick once per string and stuff like that. But I think one thing you can do that's really revealing is, uh, you know, put the metronome on and try to just play a scale, eighth notes, whatever triplets with just the left hand, just the strength of your left hand, no pick and see if you can keep it in time and keep it even. And I feel like that's super revealing and it really shows where your left hand's at. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, the thing that, uh, you know, and that also the, Alex Sill and the thing we did with him uh, said the same thing and sort of, now, now, I do think that, like, you know, if you have, like, a strat with a very clean sound with, like, single coils, it's not going to be a fair representation of that, but... <laughs> you I should mean, check, out, check out uh, big, uh, I don't know. that, that I, the strat. Was, I'm saying, like, yeah. even with, like, like, with that kind of thing, like, is that something that you would practice and get, like, a decent, even sound with, or would you... Like just playing with your left hand, would you would you do that or me? Yeah, like would you like? I, it seems like that wouldn't get that down. So I have like a bunch of exercises that I mean, you know, if you want to get into exercises and shit, I mean, one of them uh, is like this minor triad. So I'll go. Just moving a triad in fourths, and I have like this pattern. This is like a stamina exercise that I give to students and stuff. Like you probably want to move it up here. Like if you're not used to doing like stretches, you know, but like for me, I'll sit around and do stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Get my hand, the stamina and, uh, I mean, that's how I kind of just built my legato was like on that and like those pentatonic, those kind of phrases or like doing this kind of, you know, that kind of thing. So there's no pick, right? So you just come right. up with a pattern 
out there. You have no excuses. Uh, you have no excuses, people. Just uh, whatever you got, just start working on your left hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's just all left hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just did it with a strat on a super clean sound. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, that's the legato question. Uh, in the first part of the solo from Panic, or is the first part of the solo from Panic Station tapped in an Eddie Van Halen fashion? I know Ellen didn't use to tap while soloing a lot, but uh, that one sound sounds a lot like tapping to me. Yeah, there's one from Road Games. I think it's that one. Yeah, there's yeah. some tapping. He does, earlier stuff. Yeah, he did some. Yeah, but then I think like once it, you know, once Eddie got super popular and then everybody started tapping, Alan was Stop like, tapping. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, like, so. I always thought tapping was super lame. That's one of my, uh, one, one of the things that I've always believed in my heart of hearts. Um, like there are a few people I'll accept it from. You know what I mean? Like Nuno. I like when Nuno does it. Man, I don't do it. I mean, I, I did it back in the day um, in the 90s or whatever. I used to be like tap, do a lot of tapping and I'd do like these, you know, three fingers on each hand and like. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Danny. But, I'm a tapping hater. You know, I yeah. can't do it. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just uh, like there's something I'm trying to look for the word. Ah. So gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Loving this series, guys. Being a Holdsworth fan since Rome Games. Thanks for sharing. And uh, by the way, make sure this isn't a statement against gay people. I think all, all you know, gay people are awesome and they should all tap. Um, it's a revelation to see guys like Brett and Daryl show people it is humanly possible to play Alan stuff for years. There were so few videos on him. I took lessons from Daryl for 12 years. Who is Daryl? Daryl Gable. Oh. Okay. Sounds yeah. awesome. Uh, when it was so limited and often... Uh, thought uh, there mu there must be scales, some random stuff. Totally agree with Brett's view. Thanks for your massive effort. Okay, Craig is saying, in terms of moving legato playing forward, how do you guys feel about players like Tom Quayle, Gustavo Assis, uh, adding different techniques to everything? I don't know. Yeah. You? Yeah, I know. That. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Tom has crazy legato, you know? Crazy legato and uh, uh, Gustavo, man, he's a great musician. You know, does a lot of hybrid picking, uh, a lot of intervallic stuff. You know, he's a great composer. Uh, yeah, I love him, man. He's great. And I do a lot of that, like uh, mm -hmm. hybrid tricking, picking, pricking. What was it? I haven't done it in a while, but I used to do this like uh, pick and then like these two fingers, you know. Need to work on it. Yeah. I used to do that type of stuff a lot. I just haven't. Like I said, I, mean, I haven't had time to work on shit or play in like a few years, really. Yeah. Well, I did write like a. 1200 page book yeah i had to do that i took up all my freaking time <laughs> still yeah um so i think there's a question for me how's it, how it been adding the whole tour stuff inside of gypsy jazz any new ideas yeah um i actually have come to the conclusion that you probably shouldn't do it uh <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, the kinds of situations you find yourself in playing gypsy jazz uh, at the Four Seasons uh, and shit like that, uh, you know, it's not really what the gig is about. That. <laughs> but yeah, I, don't, I, I was, I'm constantly now. It's I'm 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 nowhere near like you know your guys' fluency with this, obviously. Um, but I feel now like I have a place where 
I could draw some of the sounds out if I like make a roadmap for myself of how I'm going to go about it. And it's more, I have a lot of takes to do something. So I still don't do it in any sort of like, uh, when I'm like recording, I'm trying to put it in the music. It's just, it, at this point, it's such an aware decision. Like, you know what I mean? Like insert here that like, if I, I have to approach it that way, and if I do anything that way, there's just zero chance that I'm gonna like it when I listen back to it. Cause I, you know, it's it's uh, it's not it's not that improvised kind of unconscious thing coming out. It's very conscious. So it's just like I will put this leg here, and people. Right. Well, that's, so like that first take I sent to you of the C minor jam, yeah. right? That's what. That was more, this was supposed to, right, it's called the Clone Army or whatever. So I was like, all right, I'm going to fit in a bunch of Allen lines. So I had like, you know, some of my stuff too or whatever, but like I threw in a bunch of Allen lines in that one. And then every time I listened back to it, I was just like, even though it sounds shredding or whatever, but like I was just, it didn't have that thing you're talking about. So I redid it. And then the one that I sent you, like, I'm just kind of doing what I do, whatever comes out is coming out. You know, that's the way to play. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you you just don't want to see somebody playing. That's like if you're not gonna improvise, why even like yeah. um, this kind of music, right? There, there are better there are better kinds of music to do if improv- yeah. center of what you're doing. So, I think the long like the long game has to be whatever tools you choose to arm yourself with you want to be able to use them like intuitively um, yeah man that was the point of like you know all the work i did on alan was for that right mm-hmm. i wanted to use the use kind of the the harmony and stuff and the scales he was using but like i don't want to play his lines you know what i mean like i want to play just whatever comes out you know so yeah and i like a lot of like you're like you're certainly not the first person to be influenced by Alan and try to incorporate something from his playing to to you you know musically, but this thing of inserting licks has been around for a long time, right? Understanding transcribing an Alan lick, understanding what chord it's on, and executing it at a certain Music. time. Under chord it's on, so <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Huh? What'd you say? Yeah, I was saying, usually I don't feel like most people understand the chord it's on. That's why yeah. it sounds most of the time. Right? But it, so I think like, you know, they, they haven't understood the scale it comes from. So it's like, it, like best case scenario is they'll be able to have some sort of understanding of the transcription and the harmony and then sort of copy paste that into their own playing in time. Right. But what see people do is sort of understand how to treat the scale as the palette of available color and move freely over the harmony, which is really what your book is about, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Read the actual book. That's what it's about. Yeah. About yeah. trying to get, do that. And even though I show you, you know, movements and stuff that are really common for Alan, I'm trying to convince you not to do it. You know, so it's like, here they are if you want to do it. But like, really, you should just take this material and see what you can come up with. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. It's the, you're like that guy in Dewey Cox and uh, Walk Hard. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> um, well, awesome. Uh, cool. I think this is enough for the people. We've been here for an hour. Be sure, first of all, um, Somebody, I'm gonna. Somebody has to commission Thomas to do a thing, so I'll get you guys in touch. Um, be sure to check out all of Thomas Dawson and Brett Stein's social media stuff. Definitely buy Brett's book. Um, it's uh, it's an awesome book, and uh, and we need to put some money in uh, Brett's pockets for all of his hard work. And Great, guys. Thank you for your time, and we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. See you, man. Later.